my name is Dana Biggs. I am the writer and producer and director of Toph, an Avatar fan film. This is a project that we, we wanted to do for a very long time. I've always loved Avatar The Last Airbender. And ever since I knew that I was going to be a filmmaker, I always thought I would love to make something in this Avatar universe. Coming up with the idea was probably the hardest part for this pre-production section. We didn't want to just make a live action version of a scene or, or an episode of The Last Airbender. We wanted to tell a story that hadn't been told yet. We started exploring ideas, maybe something about Aang, maybe something about Aang's son Tenzin that leads into the other show or something like that and coming up with ideas. But logistically speaking, that was something that probably wasn't realistic uh, if for nothing else, because we'd have to ask some 12 year old kid to shave their head. And then one day while driving home, uh, my wife and I were talking about an episode that had Toph in it. Toph as a character is very fascinating and she's fun to watch and she's, she's a lot of people's favorite character in the show. Sounds to me like you're scared, Boulder. And I was like, wait, what if we made a film about Toph? We don't have to shave her head. And we remembered the scene in one of the later episodes where she recalls her learning earthbending for the first time and how she got lost in a cave and was found by badger moles who taught her how to earthbend. A lot of her traits, I think, really stem from this experience that she has in this 30 second scene. And I feel like it kind of just breezed over that real quick, which you can only tell so much in a 20 minute episode. So really, I think we felt like we could expand on that and do that character development a little bit more justice. Once we had the idea to make this, we wrote the script, um, started making storyboards. I uh, reached out to our DP Tanner, who had um, worked with us quite a bit in the past. He was the DP for the Gravity Falls uh, video. And so I talked to him and we watched a bunch of movies with blind people. We watched a bunch of movies that had caves in it. We even took a couple shots directly from the village, um, especially when she's running through the uh, the desert and starts to like, you know, get caught in all these branches and stuff. Um, that's very similar to the scene in the village where uh, Bryce Dallas Howard is running through the, the forest there. Tanner was a huge, huge help in the pre-production side of things for making this look the way it was gonna look. Then when it came to getting everybody else on board, um, we were able to use some of the momentum that we had from the Gravity Falls film to get people to help out with this one. Uh, we talked to our uh, buddy, Nate Doan, who was the gaffer on this project, who has also helped us with tons of other projects. Welcome YouTube to Nate's how to set up light. Uh, I've been working in commercial and corporate work for a few years and just recently made the um, sort of shift over to feature film work. Um, so I work and lead teams of crews, usually related to the lighting of feature films, short films, commercial, corporate work, and then interviews, live events sometimes, that kind of thing. As far as casting went, uh, we knew that was going to be the make or break of this project. We needed a young girl between the ages of eight and 12, and it's gonna be a tough shoot. It's gonna be outside during the summer in Arizona, and it's gonna be rough. So that was a big stress or, or worry for us was, are we gonna be able to find somebody? We uh, put out a casting call and we're actually fortunate and surprised to get a good response. But we sent them the section of the script where they reach the end of the cave and they fall down on the ground, are crying, and then the badger mole comes in and comforts them and to the point where they actually start laughing. And so we gave that to a bunch of people and a lot of, a lot of them really nailed it. Um, but the one who stood out above the rest uh, was easily Harley. She was this 10 year old girl. Her and her mom reached out. We loved the audition. We brought them in. She took direction very well. She was very professional. I always been a really, really big fan of Avatar and like, I'm really happy that I was gassed on it. Cause like, oh my gosh, that's just so cool. And Toph is my favorite character. So like. And her mom was a huge help. Was able to do makeup and, and wardrobe and things like that as well. So that was a big plus. And it's a shame that we didn't have any lines in this because her voice also sounds very, very, very much like Toph does. Cancel nail 2020. <laughs> <laughs> she was full of energy and brought so much to this role um, that what was a big worry and a stress and a potential hindrance became this huge 
strong point and forte of this whole thing. So I, I attribute why this film works as opposed to why it doesn't mostly to her performance. If her performance wasn't as good as it was, this whole thing would not have worked. Finding locations for the shoot was um, very easy in many regards and then very difficult in others. So we knew we needed a desert um, and we live in Mesa, Arizona. We just shot in our backyard, basically. There was this big portion of desert uh, on the outskirts of town and we were able to get permits and uh, set up tents and get all of our cars parked and shoot out there basically uh, unhindered. The next location that we had pinned down was the cave shots. Tanner had previously shot a project for school actually at Papago Park in Tempe, Arizona, which is essentially this gigantic hill this big, huge rock with a big hole in it. So he had shot this project over there at night and was able to make it look like a massive cavern or a cave um, as long as you were shooting against the rocks and not uh, away from them. So we went there, Tanner and I, and we uh, scouted out the location and we did a sort of pre-vis shoot uh, with just Tanner and I out there to see if we could make it work. Okay, Hi. Be, be sad. I'm a, I'm a, I'm lost. And I can't see, and I don't know why I'm looking at the camera because I don't even know where it is. And the last location that we were trying to find was where to shoot Toff's home. Where was this massive estate gonna be? We were trying to figure out, we, we looked at a bunch of different places. We looked at like uh, some like wedding venues and like random just event places and, and like trying to find a place with a wall and like a background that looked like a nice house. And a week before we started shooting, an old friend of ours, uh, Colin DeWitt, Colin heard what we were looking for and called up a few people, including the Dailies, and they were gracious enough to let us use their backyard as this uh, massive estate. It, it wasn't exactly what we were looking for, but it was close enough that we were gonna be able to make it work. With some filmmaking tricks and some VFX, we were gonna make it happen. Very, very shortly before we started filming, we finally got that location nailed down and we were ready to get started. Filming equipment isn't the most important thing. You can make anything with anything. Uh, that being said, the right equipment can make things a lot easier. It's kind of like how if you need to screw something in, you could use a screwdriver, you'll get the job done, and it will be just as good. Or you could use a drill and get it done much faster. We did want to do things faster. We shot on the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K and 4K, we uh, managed to get a hold of some iron glass lenses, which are rehoused Russian vintage cinema lenses that we were able to get from our friends at Epic Light Media. Those had this very specific, very interesting and unique look to them, which lended very well to this film. We, we were trying to only show things that Toff could see at the moment, which is her immediate surroundings. We wanted everything else to feel kind of off and kind of distant and unknowable. And so with these lenses, we were able to kind of get this very subtle and subconscious look that kind of made everything feel a little bit off, a little bit different. And, uh, and anyway, it gave the film a lot of personality, made it look very interesting. We used a DJI Ronin for our gimbal. We used Aperture 300D lights. And aside from that, we, we really didn't have all that much with us at the time, aside from C-stands and sliders and tripods and things like that. This was definitely one of the larger shoots that we had done up to this point. And luckily with the help of Nate and Tanner and, and Neil and myself, we were able to organize ourselves in a way that would work efficiently and quickly. And, and with all that being said, we definitely still ran into a lot of issues. We, we probably got much closer to heat stroke than we'd like to admit. Our gimbal operator, Darian, definitely got close. We had blisters. Running through a desert. I had seven splinters afterwards. We're running alongside her with beadboard, silks, everything, running into sticks and trying not to get cut up, trying not to trip and everything. Thankfully, everybody was safe because we had a good crew, a big enough crew. There was a little spot where we could go in for shade. Um, we were making sure everybody had water. 
um, sunscreen, everything. That's the number one thing is you just have to make sure you have a good production team who um, is keeping track of logistics. Harley was able to stay in character the entire time, even after take, after take, after take of, of um, running shots and things like that. And we gave Harley contacts to wear uh, to make her eyes white and glossed over. And uh, we made the decision to take them out whenever she was running so that uh, she could be safe as those contacts basically do make you blind. One complication though with the desert was that we wanted to get this sunset shot. We wanted this to be shot in the late afternoon as the sun is rapidly going down. Uh, however, the direction that we were shooting in was the opposite direction that the sun sets. If, you, if we were to look in the direction that the sun was setting, you would see a neighborhood. So we shot the end of the scene first and worked backwards and shot the beginning of the scene last so that there would be this gradual darkening and the shadows would slowly get longer and longer. So we moved straight along from the desert's location to the Daly's house uh, location. That was really where I think everybody's strengths really started to come out. It was really Really kind of special to see Tanner doing his thing, the thing that he's really, really good at, better than anyone else at, and, and then working with Nate, who was doing what he's best at. We were able to really make sure that everything we were getting was exactly what we wanted to get. So there's the scene, of course, where Toph is at the wall, and then you see her hand come around the wall, and it's just open desert, right? Well, that is all CGI, right? So we have this big patio wall. It's just a fenced-in backyard. Through a lot of steps, green screening, tracking markers, and uh, some good mime acting from uh, Harley, we were able to mimic a, uh, an opening in this wall and uh, basically utilize visual effects to extend that set and make it look bigger than it was. That scene ended up being a good amount of work in VFX and compositing, uh, just taking stuff out of the background, making it look a little bit more time period appropriate. Be because we had pre-planned this and we had pre vis this and, and we knew where each of these shots was gonna be happening in the location that they were happening. We, uh, we were able to make it work, and I'm sure on set a lot of people were very confused when we were like, oh yeah, this shot is outside the yard, but we're still in the yard. It, Nate's funny to talk to about that because he'll always just be like, I have no idea what you're doing. This is gonna be terrible, do it. And then afterwards he's like, how did you do that? <laughs> I was probably pretty silent on set during those shots because I'd be looking at the viewfinder and I'd be like, I don't know about this one, guys. There's, there's certain aspects where you just kind of have to imagine this is where it's going to be here. We're going to put a green screen here and this is going to be the outside, you know, and I think both of them were really good at just like um, being able to visualize that and help me out as the DP to know like where to put the camera and everything. And then like with the first location, uh, Harley absolutely killed it here. She was able to be herself and be fun and have a good time, keep the keep the mood light, even though she was exhausted and everybody else was exhausted and it was over 100 degrees outside the entire day. She was wearing uncomfortable contacts the entire time and uh, she was able to be in a good mood, be happy, be excited, and then when we said action, she went into character and goes from happy to very stressed and frustrated, crying, uh, upset, kicking a wall, which she hurt herself doing, by the way. She really kicked the wall. She did. We did that scene like four or five times, and like on the fourth or fifth time, I think she's like, yeah, I can kick it one more time. My toes are starting to hurt. When I kicked the wall, it didn't hurt until like it did when I popped my blister. I could go into specifics too. It's not good. She, uh, she committed very, very much to this role, and I, I can't say enough about her. She, she made it. She, she made this film work. After we finished there, we were gonna have everybody head out, go to lunch, eat dinner, and, uh, and then we were gonna meet back at the next location. <laughs> After we wrapped at the second location, the plan was to meet at the final location, which was Papago Park. Uh, to film all the cave shots. We're on schedule, we arrived at the right time, and we were getting ready to start shooting. We didn't have any issues with getting everybody and everything up there, except I think Nate got lost, but that's fine. And I give Dane the call. Hey, um, I know we're supposed to be shooting at like a cave, right? Pretty familiar with Papago Park, and there's no cave here. And he goes, well, yeah, there is. There's like a big hole at the top of this, uh, this rock. We started setting up the shots, and as we're setting up, we start to have some weather problems. We park, me and Nero park, and we get out, and we look up, and we go, is it drizzling? It's drizzling a little bit. 
and then it starts drizzling a little bit harder. And then it's a, you know, a pretty sizable little monsoon. The wind started picking up, it got, it got real stormy. The wind was strong enough that it, it was knocking stuff and almost people over. And we were up high, there was a cliff to one side of us and a steep drop on the other. And then thunder and lightning. I go, hmm. And I look over and we've got our whole crew basically holding lightning rods as high up into the air as they possibly can, just trying to carry sea stands up this mountain. At that point that we realized that it just wasn't going to be safe to do that. And on top of that, it wasn't gonna look very good either. We were, everything was windy. That much wind in a cave is weird. <laughs> um, I haven't been in many caves in my life, but I don't remember them being particularly windy. It turns out most everybody was available the weekend after this. So we decided to postpone, we wrapped there, and uh, decided to come back a week later. Uh, in that week, Tanner and I explored a lot of other ideas for how to light the scene. We weren't super pleased with how the lighting was turning out anyway. We discussed alternate forms of, of lighting that scene. Again, we knew the light was unmotivated. We were trying to figure out a nice way to kind of illuminate and make it bright enough for the audience to see. Um, we decided to use a, a technique that Roger Deakins uses a lot, um, the cove light. For that last shoot, we used uh, two LED panels, one big one, one small one, and a bed sheet. And that was it. We had to cut holes in the bed sheet so that the wind wouldn't blow it over. But that was it. We had previously made the decision before we even went up there that we were not going to have Harley wear her contacts because the ground was very uneven and again there is it wasn't a total cliff on the side that we were but it was a steep drop and we didn't want to risk any injuries so uh, we opted to have her leave her contacts out which was the safe option however made the effects very time consuming and difficult. <laughs> when we were shooting the shots with the badger mole in it. We were able to use this uh, stand-in badger mole nose that we made that was operated by Neil, our VFX supervisor. And uh, we were able to use that to interact with Harley, give her something to act against, also help with visual effects, give it the shadows and the lighting and everything, so we were able to have that reference. Tanner and I really figured out the shots that we wanted well in advance and were able to plan for all these different eventualities. We did a lot of work in pre-production to ensure that the shots that we wanted to get, we were gonna be able to get. All in all, it ended up being a very successful shoot. Um, if you look at the raw footage, it looks kind of funny because a lot of them don't look like a cave. <laughs> Um, but that was where VFX were going to come in. With this project, it quickly became apparent that I was going to have to do most of the work. And doing the editing and VFX and everything turned out to be uh, a much longer process than was intended. We were able to get a cut together. We were able to get some rough sound design together. And most importantly, as far as post-production goes, we were able to get a custom score made. Tanner Stuffelbeam returned to score this project, which he scored a lot of our projects in the past couple years, and he's phenomenal, and every single piece he does is better than the last one. He came up with this score. All I told him was that it had to sound like the app. It sound like the show, but it can't have anything from the show. And so he went off and he made this this seven minute song to go along with this whole thing. When I put it in, to the edit that I had at the time, it literally brought me to tears at parts. Oh gosh, Tanner, you made me cry. <laughs> Tanner's music has always been what really elevated any project we worked on and definitely did so here. Uh, we also made the decision before we started shooting to not capture sound on set. Audio was not gonna be something that we were easily gonna be able to capture. So that was just something that we decided to avoid and it did save us plenty of time while shooting later on. Uh, my wife and I were able to go and record a whole bunch of folly. We were able to record fabric noises and shoe noises and, and, and jumping and running and all that kind of stuff. We were able to record that in my backyard very easily. So every single thing you hear in this film is 100% done in post. We did have some help as well from uh, a few other people. I voiced Toff's mom, um, Poppy Beifong, in this. My name is Madison Brunaler. I am a voice actress and character actor. I am most well known for voicing Happy Frog in Five Nights at Freddy's. Neil and I, uh, we each had essentially full-time jobs. It, it, it quickly became apparent that if we don't finish this thing fast, it will never get done. But every time we would sit down and really try and do something, 
something else would come up, something else would happen. Neil and I also have a gaming YouTube channel that we've been running for the last year or two called Gamers in the Attic. Or we recently completed a big event that we wanted to do and decided that after that we were going to take a break from that YouTube channel so that we could focus on this film. And we wouldn't come back to that YouTube channel until this was done. Then finally, after a while, business began to pick up in a way that made it so that Neil was able to quit his job and come work here full time. And that was really the point where everything changed because we were able to dedicate days and weeks to just working on this project. So on this short, um, I, I made all the, all the 3D visual effects, so the badger mole I created, I made all the rock explosions, all the simulations for that, the gate that we put in. The, the biggest process with all this was me just trying to learn how to do stuff. This isn't our first rodeo with CG creatures. Our crawl video had a CG creature in it. Our, uh, we made a commercial about tea that had a giant floating fish in it that, that we animated too. So we, we've done this before, but we've never built anything from scratch before. The, the way the whole 3D animation process works with a creature is you build the creature out of basically building blocks, then you sculpt it, make it nice and smooth, make it pretty looking, throw some bones in that thing, have those bones react to other things, Usually it's pretty simple, you move a bone and then that piece of the body should move. But then we found out because this isn't a real creature and this is a rig that I built from scratch, that when you move the bone it would bend the body in a weird way so it wouldn't work right, so you'd restart and you know re-rig it out and basically just redo it from scratch and just do that over and over again until finally something, some, you get something that kind of works. And then you gotta try and animate it. Animating this thing, was tough all by itself because I mean first off we didn't have any reference you know badgers don't walk like this moles don't walk like this there's no such thing as a badger mole that walks like this <laughs> and so we had a we're trying to find a way to, to make it move right and feel heavy enough to, but also low enough to the ground and, and we couldn't really figure out like a good reference to use until finally we started looking at elephants elephants are are these huge creatures that that actually walk really gracefully. <laughs> and so looking at references of elephants just walking, we're able to, to match that same foot movement um, with the badger mole and it actually looked pretty decent for, for most of it. And then on top of that, we had to add fur to the, the creature. Fun fact, every single badger mole shot has a different hair modifier. All because it, we got, it had to get more and more detail as we went with the shots. There's this one shot where it pans over and you get really high detail to, to, to the badger mole. And I think that render took over 48 hours to render out because of how many hair particles were in that detail. And that was just the badger mole. I also had to do all the earth bending shots. Every earth bending shot had a, a lot that went into it. I mean, first we had to, we had to cut Toph out. So we had to get a clean plate of the plate in the background. Then we had to project that clean plate onto a 3D wall that we built. And then we had to fracture that wall and make it fracture in a way that actually looks like broken rock and not just like blocks and cubes and stuff. And then we had to take that wall and then make it fall naturally with the rigid bodies and make it like actually look like it's falling rocks and timed right. And then on top of that, just adding smoke simulations to it and particles and the light shafts coming in and all of it. And on top of that, giving all that to Danon who added more and composited all into the real footage. And we had to do this for every single wall break shot. And that was pretty much the last week of this whole post-production process was just crunching numbers on these spoke simulations and wall breaks and just trying to get everything to to look good. And, and with all these renders, we had to pick and choose kind of how much quality and how much time we want to put into each of these shots. Rendering times, I mean, all of this, every, every shot here, I think it took like at least 10 minutes to render a single frame. And so if you're talking 24 frames in a second, it's a lot of rendering time that we had to deal with. You may have noticed some of these shots aren't, aren't perfect. Uh, they're not. Probably not Hollywood quality on a lot of them, but I think we, I think we did pretty good. Uh, one thing that really helped us out was the fact that we were shooting in Arizona. So I, I find Arizona to sort of be the wild west of filmmaking, um, for the better and for the worse. Arizona is, an, is a fantastic resource when it comes to finding locations finding crew members and finding cast members. The camera operators, um, all kinds of grip and electric. Uh, you can crew up with a great crew um, for any of those. We have uh, grip trucks, we have full service rental houses. It's, it's close to LA, so we get a lot of people who live here, work there, but it's also far enough away that it's cheap to shoot here, it's cheap to live here. 
So Arizona actually has this very, this very strong uh, filmmaking community that we were able to utilize while making this. Every, every location that we shot was within a 20 mile radius. It was a very easy shoot in that regard. We didn't need to worry about travel or anything like that. There is this sort of stigma around fan films. Um, a lot of filmmakers uh, will often talk about fan films as kind of like a guilty pleasure. Like, oh yeah, I've made a, I've made a fan film. Shh, 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 don't, tell, don't tell anybody. Honestly, I wish there was more fan films in Hollywood because so much of the time the people that are making these adaptations of these beloved fan projects are only in it for the money, but don't care about the actual original source material. So much more of the time, fan films actually are a good representation. Like you want like, oh, I would love to see the live action version of this. Hollywood's not gonna do it right. <laughs> so I wish there was more fans that would actually be making, making the adaptations of them because they are always the ones that are like, no, we are committed to this. I think just because you are using an intellectual property that already exists doesn't inherently make it bad. It's like everything's based off of something and everything is, you know, created off the inspiration of other things. I always loved The Sorcerer's Apprentice. And I remember watching the behind the scenes to that and I just thought it was super fun. And then I realized that it's just a fan film for Fantasia. <laughs> they just took this old story and they expanded on it. Like a film is a film and, and I think a well-made film is a well-made film. And if you're making it for something that already has an existing IP, I think that's all the better. I think it's best if you're a young filmmaker to develop your skills to find something you can adapt or some IP that's already established because it's just easier to sort of use that as a springboard. And um, I think, I think it, it combines two passions. I see a lot of people writing films that don't have much direction, don't have anything to, to say, and don't have a theme. And during production, you start to feel that. The other positive thing about fan films is that they tend to be seen more often. You get more feedback, you get more eyes on it, you get more critiques, you, you get to see what people like, you get to see what people don't like. Reading these comments is incredible. Like, to see how much these people love these IPs and how much they can connect to um, Slack Shack's love for those IPs, that's way more special than anything you're ever going to get out of a, an indie short film. What is the comments on an indie short film? Great cinematography, great sound? Yeah, I don't think that's as, as important. There, there's always a place for fan films. There's always more stories to tell and there's always more ways to tell those stories. This, this has definitely been the biggest and hardest project we've ever done. It's also been the most informative project, the one we've learned the most doing, and it's also been the funnest one. It's the one that we're most proud of and we hope that you guys like the movie as much as we liked making it and we're excited to move on to the next one. Uh, for almost every shoot we do, we get cops. We get we have we have police interactions almost every time. Sometimes people call the cops on us. Sometimes cops just stop and they go, "What are you guys doing?" Uh, and this one we didn't. It was uh, totally legit. We had no problems. <laughs> so it turns it turns out when you get permits for stuff, cops don't bother you. So maybe do that.